Today is Friday, September 14, 2018, and you're tuned into The Revolution. In this episode, you'll be hearing two articles that appear in this week's edition of Revolution Newspaper, as updated daily on the website revcom.us, the voice of the Revolutionary Communist Party USA. First, you'll hear the article, The Kavanaugh Emergency. We don't need to save our court. We do need to resist and stop Kavanaugh. Stop a fascist America and get organized for an actual revolution by Sansara Taylor. Also in today's episode is Yet Another American Crime in Latin America. U.S. officials secretly met with Venezuela coup plotters. The Kavanaugh Emergency. We don't need to save our court. We do need to resist and stop Kavanaugh. Stop a fascist America and get organized for an actual revolution. By Sincera Taylor, September 10, 2018. The past week has witnessed Senate hearings over the most monumental Supreme Court nomination in decades. In a matter of weeks, the Supreme Court could have not just a conservative majority, but a solidly pro-fascist majority that is a pliant tool in the Trump-Pence regime's drive to make America white again, to impose Christian fascist theocracy, to completely deregulate and accelerate the destruction of our planet, and to eviscerate civil rights and civil liberties. Christian fascist ghouls, America first warmongers, and racists everywhere are absolutely giddy. A nominee to drag America back to Trump's retrograde vision of greatness. Brett Kavanaugh is a stone-cold originalist. Originalism is a theory of law which holds that any right that is not explicitly written in the Constitution or in a ratified amendment in which is not rooted into the traditions and conscience of our people simply does not exist. But what were the rights written into the Constitution? The right to hold black people in shadow of slavery, of husbands to rape their wives, of white settlers to exterminate native peoples and more? And while there have been amendments since then, that have restricted and overturned some of these atrocities, the traditions and conscience of America have been an unbroken chain of racist lynchings, whether by KKK or by police, of epidemic violence against and denial of reproductive rights to women, of destruction poisoning of the environment, of draconian repression against political dissidents and revolutionaries, of xenophobic racism, of anti-LGBTQ bigotry, and many more violations of the fundamental rights of the people. Concretely, this legal theory has been used as a cudgel for decades now, starting in earnest during the Supreme Court headed by William Rehnquist, Kavanaugh's first judicial hero to reverse and or gut the whole direction the Supreme Court had taken in the 1960s and 70s during the era when rights were being expanded to black people, to women, and to many others. Kavanaugh explicitly celebrated Rehnquist's dissent disagreement in the Supreme Court ruling which legalized abortion, Roe v. Wade, as well as Rehnquist successes in drastically expanding the ability of the police and prosecutors to use illegally obtained evidence in the courts to convict and imprison people accused of crimes. And Kavanaugh's own record shows extreme hostility to women's rights to abortion and even birth control, to the separation of church and state, to environmental regulations, to attempts to curtail racism and discrimination, 
to torture victims and much, much more. The Democrats resist, but on ruling class terms. Many leading Democrats are genuinely alarmed at the way Kavanaugh will turn the highest court into a tool in Trump's strive to rip up the social compact and legitimating norms that have held this country together for generations. They are also alarmed about how Trump's court packing could lock in Republic fascist rule no matter what, both by eviscerating voting rights, cementing gerrymandering, etc., and through the fact that a majority fascist Supreme Court will give these Republic fascist veto power for the next 30 years over any social legislation, even if the Democrats somehow gain a majority in one or both houses of Congress. Because of this, the hearing has been marked at times by an unusual level of open defiance from Democrats. Through their questions and invited experts, they have dragged into the open Kavanaugh's hostility to the rights of women, LGBTQ people, black people, and others. His likely role in George W. Bush's crimes against humanity and his shocking views that the president is above the law. However, it is important to note that these Democrats have saved their real fire for more procedural complaints, like the fact that Republicans kept much of Kavanaugh's record sealed. Kamala Harris, for example, interrupted the fascist Republican Chuck Grassley to ask that he postpone the hearings to allow time to review newly released documents. Dick Durbin appealed directly to Kavanaugh to postpone his own hearings, again to be able to review documents. Cory Booker likened himself to Spartacus, the leader of a historic slave revolt and expressed willingness to endure censure or even be kicked out of the Senate for reading into the record a document that had been sealed from the public. While it is a fascist maneuver by the Republicans to keep so much of Kavanaugh's record secret, focusing on this obscures the bold-faced reality that Kavanaugh's views are already well known. It further obscures the fact that these Democrats, even as they raise a hue and cry, more fundamentally are participating in and legitimizing the approval of this completely illegitimate pro-fascist judge. In fact, even as they put on their show of opposition, they bent over backwards to demonstrate their civility towards the fascists. Dianne Feinstein, before asking a single question of Kavanaugh, apologized to him for the protesters who kept courageously disrupting. Cory Booker, even as he challenged the process, praised Grassley for showing the patience of Job. Contrast this to the way Republicans blocked not just Merrick Garland, Obama's Supreme Court nominee, refusing to even meet with him or give him a hearing for over a year, but also dozens of other federal judges nominated by Obama. Because of their efforts, when Trump assumed the presidency, he had not just an empty Supreme Court seat to fill, but also 107 other judgeships. By contrast, Reagan had 35 judgeships to fill and Obama had 54. And quiet as it's been kept, just last week, Democratic leader Chuck Schumer personally fast-tracked 15 more of Trump's fascist federal judges for approval. Still, while it is essential to recognize and call out the objectively collaborationist dynamic of the Democrats' resistance, it is also a fact that even this very narrowly constrained opposition, together with the major ruling class challenges to Trump, including everything concentrated in McCain's funeral and the anonymous op-ed from a high-level White House official, is contributing to arousing a fighting spirit of people across this country who yearn to see this nightmare ended. The Righteous Anger of the People 
which way will it go? More than 200 people have been arrested for courageously disrupting the hearings and or occupying senators' offices, and each reflects and represents the simmering anger of countless others who are watching in horror and anguish across the country. These righteous disruptors have yelled out about the women who will die from illegal abortions, about the disabled who will lose their health care and possibly their lives, about the rights of black people and native people and more. This anger is righteous and extremely positive. At the same time, even more frequently people have cried out to senators to save our courts and save our democracy. This reveals dangerous illusions that, if not diverted, will not lead to good results. The Supreme Court is not our court, and the U.S. is not our democracy. The cold truth is that the Supreme Court is not our court, and the system, the rules over us, is not our democracy. Rather, as Baba Vakin, chairman of the Revolutionary Communist Party, has put it, the essence of what exists in the U.S. is not democracy, but capitalism imperialism and political structures to enforce that capitalism imperialism. As he expounds much more fully in his pamphlet, Constitution, Law and Rights, in Capitalist Society and in the Future Socialist Society, the Supreme Court of the United States is exactly one of the political structures that enforces the system of capitalism imperialism. The truth of this can be seen, for example, in the reality that even before Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy resigned, and Kavanaugh was appointed, the Supreme Court upheld Trump's Muslim ban, presided over a regime of white supremacists, mass incarceration, and police terror, allowed restrictions so severe and multitudinous that abortion rights now hang by a thread, protected the right of a Christian fascist baker to deny services to a gay couple, dramatically restricted labor rights, and much more. Real change in the interests of the people cannot be won by relying on these ruling class institutions. To be clear, the court may at times reflect a ruling class consensus to make certain concessions, often in response to struggle from below but the foundational economic and social relations of capitalism and imperialism remain in place and the purpose of the concessions themselves is to protect and expand those relations. A time to fight and to get organized for an actual revolution. All this does not mean that nothing can be done. To the contrary, now is the time to fight to unite with and unleash an even greater spirit of defiance and outpouring a furious refusal, and to lift our sights as we do. More than anything else, this dangerous moment, with its fight between outright fascists and the more mainstream imperialists grouped around the Democratic Party, reveals the absolute worthlessness and outmoded nature of the system of capitalism and imperialism. It reveals the truth that the interests of those who rule over us are not the interests of the people. It reveals the need for an actual revolution that overthrows this system, sweeps aside its laws and institutions of repression, and implements a radically different system rooted in a radically different mode of production and with radically different social relations, values, and ways of relating to the rest of the world. This is what is concentrated in the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America, authored by Bob Avakian, a far better liberating society that is geared towards meeting people's fundamental needs overcoming all exploitation and oppression, 
and doing this together with people all over the world, even as the rights of the individual and rule of law are protected in far stronger and qualitatively different ways than they are now. Rather than pleading with or picking sides between the different factions of those who rule over us, the people need to take advantage of this sharp contention at the top to break through with our interests, to make real advances in propagating the need for, getting organized for, and fighting the power in ways that contribute to an actual revolution. How to do this and to what aim is laid out in this pamphlet. Unite all who can be united to drive out the fascist Trump-Pence regime. A decisive and very urgent part of this now is fighting to mobilize all who can be united, including many who are not yet convinced of the need for revolution, but who recognize the emergency being faced in the Trump-Pence regime right now, to step outside of the official channels of the system that rules over us and truly resist. To raise the demand, this nightmare must end. The Trump-Pence regime must go and build organization and strength to get in position to launch, sustain, mass independent political protests that start with many thousands and grow to millions and do not stop day after day, night after night, until the whole regime has been driven from power. As RefuseFascism.org correctly insists, only the people can stop a fascist America. What each of us does in these fraught days will truly matter. This nightmare must end. The Trump-Pence regime must go. In the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. Yet another American crime in Latin America. U.S. officials secretly met with Venezuela coup plotters. It's just been revealed that beginning last year, U.S. officials secretly met a number of times with Venezuelan military officers who were plotting a coup to overthrow the government of President Nicolas Maduro. Maduro's is an oppressive not a revolutionary or socialist government, and his action by the U.S. is yet another crime and outrage against the people of Latin America. According to the September 8th New York Times, Trump administration discussed coup plans with rebel Venezuelan officers. One of the military commanders the U.S. was meeting with has been accused of torturing critics, jailing hundreds of political prisoners, wounding thousands of civilians, trafficking drugs, and other crimes. This is exactly the kind of criminal the U.S. imperialists have worked with across Latin America and the world to further their interest for the last 100 plus years and counting. The Trump-Pence regime claims it's trying to bring positive change to Venezuela. Apparently, they consider criminals like this the right kind of men for the kind of change they have in mind. The U.S. did not end up backing this particular reactionary plot with arms, funds, or equipment. Yet just meeting with these reactionaries could well have had the impact of encouraging them. And the U.S. rulers, starting with Bush and Obama and now escalating under Trump, have imposed harsh economic sanctions on Venezuela and continue to threaten it with military action. One key reason the U.S. backed off, according to the Times report, fear that the effort could backfire politically in Latin America because of the widespread hatred of America's covert intervention across Latin America, 
including in the Times words, backing previous rebellions, coups, and plots in countries like Cuba, Nicaragua, Brazil, and Chile, and for turning a blind eye to the abuses military regimes committed during the Cold War. And that's not the half of it. The U.S. has carried out colonialist and imperialist aggression against its southern neighbors from its founding right up to the present day. Seriously look into this history. You'll find America isn't the greatest country on earth, but it has committed the greatest crimes on earth. A few examples of American crimes in Latin America alone. Case number 57, the 1973 CIA coup in Chile. The crime. Beginning in the early morning hours of September 11, 1973, the Chilean military, with political guidance and secret backing from the U.S., carried out a military coup against the government of Chilean President Salvador Allende. With U.S. Navy ships offshore and U.S. spy planes overhead as backup, the Chilean Air Force and tanks and soldiers from the Chilean Army dropped bombs and launched artillery and small arms fire in a furious coordinated assault on the La Moneda Palace, the central government building in Chile's capital, Santiago. Allende, a social democrat elected on a platform of social reform three years previously, was killed along with a small group of defenders. The CIA had collected arrest lists and key government installations which needed to be taken over, according to a 1975 U.S. Senate investigation. In the hours, days, and weeks that followed the coup, tens of thousands of officials of Allende's government and the Unidad Popular governing coalition, along with workers, union leaders, activists, students, progressive intellectuals, artists, and people who just happened to be on the streets on the morning of September 11, were rounded up, then held in the Santiago's National and Chile stadiums, and in military installations, and facilities converted to concentration camps in locations across the country. They were subjected to brutal physical and psychological torture, or just outright murdered. Case number 83, the U.S.-Mexico War of 1846 to 1848. The Crime. In the spring of 1846, U.S. President James Polk sent General Zachary Taylor and several thousand U.S. troops into what had been, before slaveholding settlers from the U.S. declared it an independent Republic of Texas in 1836, Mexican territory between the Nueces and Rio Grande rivers, near the Gulf of Mexico, with the goal of provoking a war. When Taylor's troops arrived at the Mexican town of Matamores on the Rio Grande and began menacing maneuvers, they were attacked by a force of Mexicans, just as Polk and his cabinet believed they would be. President Polk wasted no time in declaring Mexico guilty of aggression against the U.S. Case number 38. The U.S. backs El Salvador's death squad government 1980-1992. to The Crime Throughout the decades of the 1980s into the early 1990s, the U.S. government backed, trained, and financed the reactionary government and military of the Central American country of El Salvador in its murderous counterinsurgency war that killed tens of thousands of workers, peasants, students, intellectuals, artists, and others, and forced hundreds of thousands to flee into exile. El Salvador was dominated by U.S. imperialism in league with a few Salvadoran fami families who controlled the vast majority of the country's land and wealth, while millions of peasants, workers, and others lived in extreme poverty. They had no democratic rights, and during the 1960s and 1970s, their political protests were violently suppressed. In 1977, the Salvadoran military killed hundreds of peacefully protesting voter fraud. The Salvadoran government unleashed paramilitary vigilante groups, or death squads, against its opponents, kidnapping and murdering leaders of labor unions, peasant organizations, political parties, and guerrilla groups, as well as, pre 
as well as priests and lay religious workers who sided with the poor. Case number 43, the U.S. Invasion of Panama, 1989-1990. The Crime On December 20th, 1989, the U.S. military invaded Panama with 27,684 troops and 300 aircraft, killing thousands of civilians and removing Manuel Noriega and his Panamanian Defense Force. PDF from power. The invasion was given the name Operation Just Cause by U.S. Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney. The Central American Human Rights Commission reported, quote, the most devastated civilian neighborhoods, such as Chor Chorillos and San Miguelito, were extremely poor, densely populated areas. Half of the neighborhood of Chorillos, which had a pre-invasion population of approximately 25,000 was literally destroyed by U.S. troops and civilian residents were victims of direct attacks. Case number 75, Obama, Clinton, and the 2009 military coup in Honduras. The crime. On June 28, 2009, the Honduran military carried out a coup d'etat against the elected president, Manuel Zelaya, a liberal-leaning populist. The coup had crucial backing from the then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and the U.S. State Department. The generals and politicians behind the coup brought to power a more openly fascistic and pro-U.S. regime that plunged the Honduran people even more deeply into the hell of U.S. domination, state-sponsored political assassinations and terrorism and intensified violence, poverty, and oppression. These horrors remain in effect to this day, with U.S. backing. For more, see the entire American Crime series at revcom.us, also appearing in this week's issue. Letter from a Prisoner A prisoner who has been given the opportunity to engage and grapple with the path-breaking works of Bob Avakian. And tens of thousands join Rise for Climate actions across the U.S. and around the world. You can find these articles and so much more at revcom.us. Revcom.us, Revolution Newspaper, is the lifeline that cuts through events to reveal the need for revolution and how to move now to hasten and prepare for that revolution. Revcom.us is the voice of the Revolutionary Communist Party, USA.